Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seventh edition of um, uh, the School for Politics and Critique um, for this year. This is um, since 2014, the seventh edition of uh, this school, supported by uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, Stiftung Foundation for Southeast Europe. Um, uh, we are very thankful uh, that they recognized our um, idea to um, gather um, uh, contemporary knowledge theorists, but also activists uh, to discuss on um, um, topics that are relevant not only for the region, but also uh, globally. This year's theme is climate justice in um, an age of unbridled capitalism and is uh, dedicated to current political and activist issues uh, in the region and abroad. Um, and um, has a, uh, its aim is to, um, as I've said, to bring the relevant knowledge, but also um, um, interesting um, a, a new ideas, radical ideas um, in uh, fields, in areas of materialism, feminism, eco-socialism, Marxism, climate uh, science. Um, uh, in, um, in discussing the topic uh, uh, of climate change, but uh, also this year we would like to address uh, through this uh, multidisciplinary approach um, um, uh, uh, also um, the topic of climate justice and climate change, um, but um, um, uh, also tackle the uh, um, rise and persistence of uh, authoritarian uh, and illiberal um, uh, regimes. Uh, especially uh, in the region, uh, but uh, uh, and for us very important uh, perspective um, that we want to also um, have uh, throughout the school is uh, the feminist uh, is uh, the feminist the political and uh, theoretical aspect um, um, regarding the um, this year's topic. Um, Therefore, we will have a um, very interesting, uh, I um, uh, hope, uh, discussions uh, to uh, the lectures that uh, um, uh, um, from our invited speakers that we have this year. Um, and um, probably, I hope we, we, we will tackle and we will uh, try to. Uh, uh, everything that we lived through during this pandemic um, um, in uh, some uh, perspective and maybe uh, exchange some uh, alternatives or, or uh, discuss hope, although um, uh, we are currently again facing not just another wave of the pandemic and all the effects and uh, of the climate change this uh, summer as well in Macedonia with um, natural disasters, but also these three days are um, days of mourning in Macedonia uh, because of another tragedy that happened um, yesterday. So it kind of uh, again uh, sets the scene in this um, um, uh, how should I say emergent uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic setting but Hopefully that these discussions and these um, um, suggestions that we have to discuss um, during um, the uh, three days that we have in front of us will um, 
raise some uh, sense of hope. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, I will um, introduce our first lecturer uh, for today. Um, it is our guest, uh, uh, Blair Taylor. Um, he is program director of the Institute of, for Social Ecology, uh, which is a popular education center for ecological scholarship and advocacy. Um, he's also, um, uh, holds a, he also holds a PhD in political science from the New School for Social Research uh, and um, um, writes a lot on um, about uh, US social movements, contemporary far right politics, political ecology, and the history of the left. Uh, he was co editor uh, in um, Murray Bookchin's anthology, uh, The Next Revolution popular assemblies and the promise uh, of direct democracy um, from 2014. He lives um, uh, outside Seattle, in Washington, and is active in West Sound Democratic Socialists of America. Um, the title of uh, his lecture today is uh, From Social Distancing to Social Transformation, Eco-Socialist Movements in the uh, Wake of COVID. So Blair, uh, please uh, come and take uh, the floor. The hot seat. Hi folks out in TV land. It's really nice to be here. Um, first of all, just thank you to Katarina and Zachary and Risto and Stravko and everyone else for Anna for putting this together and inviting me. Um, it's great to finally meet Katarina, who I've interacted with, you know, for the past few years online and who did a really fun interview together for a journal a few years back. Um, also, my first opportunity to come back to Europe since 2018, when um, I was last in Croatia for the Institute for Political Ecology conference in Vis, which was a really fantastic gathering of folks from all over Europe, but especially Southeastern Europe, really engaging with these same themes. So I'm hoping that we can kind of build on those and I'm glad to see it's mostly new faces. I was wondering how much overlap there would be, but I, it makes me feel like it's part of an ongoing um, conversation. So it's obviously been a really wild year, um, unprecedented in so many ways, and it's easy to get swept along by what's going on. I know I certainly have, um, which is why creating organized spaces like this to reflect on what's happening is really um, critical so we can reflect and reassess. It's, it's just a really important space. So thanks for providing this. Um, it's a great opportunity for myself to also think of you know where we're at at the current moment. So as Anna mentioned, um, the kind of placeholder name I gave for this talk a long time ago. I'm just gonna move this a little bit so I'm not looking at the top little section of my head. Um, the, the placeholder name was From Social Distancing to Social Transformation, Eco-Socialist Movements in the Wake of COVID. It's a bit of a placeholder. It's gonna, it's more gonna be just a jumping off point to kind of take stock of where we're at, which was as movements, which was kind of the idea and the current conjuncture of political, economic, and natural forces, but also discuss these themes in relation to some of, I guess, my primary research and political interests, recuperation, eco-fascism, and social ecology, which I consider is you know, a, a variant of eco-socialism. So we're no doubt living in the interesting times that the uh, alleged Chinese uh, curse wished upon its enemies, um, probably fake. But I, so I won't attempt to offer any kind of crystal ball predictions or schematic political bl blueprints today, but rather I want to kind of explore some of what I think are the key questions and some maybe promising directions for exploration um, in the context of our shared thematic of establishing a united front through eco-socialism, Marxist feminism, and critiques of authoritarianism. Now, you know you're at a leftist conference when you have a very long subtitle after the colon, so we're in good company here. So um, while a lot of the, I, I lived in Europe for the better part of a decade. I lived in the Czech Republic for three, four years, and then in Berlin for um, four or five years with little bits in between in New York. So I recently moved back to the United States about four years ago, in fact, to my hometown. So um, a lot of my examples will be focused on the US and also Germany, but I think they're also broad enough to provide a, a jumping off point for our discussions. And I'm sure we can find some points of commonality, but also some points of difference, which I think will be useful and interesting to see what we're facing and what we're not facing um, locally, regionally, internationally, et cetera. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all um, over the course of the weekend, what your experiences are, 
how they match or don't match with mine and others um, from other places. So where are we now? Um, taking stock of the current moment. The overlapping social and environmental crises we face have never been more obvious. I mean, I feel this summer was really in many ways a watershed moment. Um, we had climate change fueled heat waves breaking records in the Northwest. We had two weeks of unprecedented triple digit um, weather in the Northwest. Where I live in Bremerton, Washington, I live on the water and literally the heat fried the beach. Like it smelled like rotting seafood for weeks because all the shellfish had just been baked in the sun. It was quite disgusting. Um, wildfires in across the, the Western United States and Canada, but also here in Greece and Turkey and other places. Unprecedented. Okay, I, I, is that the tragedy that you mentioned? I, I was. Uh, the wildfires were during the summer. Yesterday was a fire. Uh, oh God! Oh, it's a fire. 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 Fire broke out in the hospital. Awful. Awful. Uh, because they were under stuff. <laughs> you uh, they were letting people volunteer or whatever family oh, I don't know what happened there, but some kind of mechanism was broken. I'm gonna I get don't know if the fire did do that, but you know the chaotic circumstances to be attributed to the pandemic itself. Of course. Um that's funny because I will be going there myself in a moment. Unprecedented flooding um, in Germany and in the eastern and southeastern United States. Um, and of course, all of this is taking taking place against the backdrop of resurgent COVID, you know, posting record numbers in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and with people being flown to hospitals, you know, in other states in the United States because all the hospital beds are full because of decades of neoliberal downsizing has made these you know efficient hospitals that just don't have enough beds and speaking of the fires I mean my sister works as a social worker in the emergency room uh, in the local hospital and they're in the process of laying off all their workers and rehiring them so that they can pay them less and get rid of a bunch of them like in the midst of a pandemic where there's also an outbreak at the hospital that's capitalist logic um, at its finest and in fact they also closed the hospital that me and most of my family were born in um, in the middle of the pandemic uh, they they've been building a new hospital about 10 miles away and even though this is you know a perfectly usable hospital they close it down because it wasn't profitable so again the the intersecting health environmental social crises um, have been exacerbated by COVID. Okay. Um, the disease, of course, is also surging alongside a massive wave of conspiracist inf disinformation, which is fueling some very novel reconfigurations of the far right that we'll talk about a little bit, combining with new age, anti-vaccine and anti-status rhetoric. Um, and of course, the COVID pandemic is following upon and exacerbates two other recent systemic shocks, the 2008 financial crisis and the ongoing right populist wave you know, across much of Europe and the United States, which seems far from over and COVID seems to be fueling even more. So the result has been political instability, environmental chaos and deepening inequality. So what has been the response to all this by the left, right and the center? Of course, on the one hand, none of this has gone uncontested. Um, we've seen social movements organizing across the globe, working to create a very different kind of world, but nowhere, as we know, have they congealed and into any kind of systemic threat or sustained alternative. Um, various left, left electoral insurgencies, obviously Corbyn and Sanders being two of the most prominent, have inspired but failed to achieve power, at least yet. And meanwhile, the combination of Trump, Brexit, the rise of you know, right-wing parties like AfD in Germany uh, and other populist shocks elsewhere, have been you know, followed on the heels by COVID and the, the prolonged lockdown, all this collectively has created this longing for a return to normalcy by the center in particular, i.e. let's get back to responsible leaders and vaccines so we can go back to business as usual. And in many ways, Biden um, ran as in the United States, ran as the candidate of back to, back to the pre-Trump normalcy, you know, the Obama sheen of a, a respectable, uh, eloquent, non-extremist politician. As we say in the United States, um, 
about you know liberals and the professional managerial class man we just want to go back to brunch you know the kind of the classic weekend activity of urban liberals of you know going out for their extended mimosas and back to brunch has become it's a meme uh, at least in north america for this desire to go back to normalcy to the pre-trump pre-covid era so this might be also another topic we can discuss later is the class makeup of the contemporary left and ecological movements there's a lot been a lot of debate in the left in america in the last few days about the pmc the professional managerial class um, as kind of a substitute for the working class and how that gives our movements a certain class flavor that makes them very limited so, but even among establishment politicians, there's been a growing recognition that things can't simply continue as before. The most recent UN IPCC uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report uh, gave the message of a code red for humanity, which coincided with multiple extreme weather events across the world, and of course the massive social and economic dislocations of COVID. So after decades of neoliberal austerity and fiscal conservatism, segments of the ruling class in many nations have been forced by events to return to a Keynesian government intervention in the economy model on a massive scale, including direct payments in the United States and expansion of social services. This is quite a, a shocking reversal in some ways of decades of neoliberalism. Um, just as in 2008, though, it seems the only way to save capitalism was to infuse it with lots of cash, which could be another thing we might want to discuss is the I don't know if any of you have seen this this meme money machine go burr. It's a, a funny one. It's kind of a reference to modern monetary theory or MM, MMT, but it's like, you can't just print more money. And then the, the Federal Reserve saying, money machine go burr, burr, burr. Yes, we can. We're just going to print more. And that's the way we're going to solve these problems. So the US left uh, has tried to seize this moment to push for a permanent reorganization of the political and economic system. As a result, eco-socialism is suddenly being discussed in the mainstream. Only very recently, this was a very fringe discourse, and now it's very kind of shocking to hear it being not only debated in the mainstream media, but debated on the floor of Congress. This is just incomprehensible to me even five years ago, let alone 10 years ago when it was far left, green, et cetera, et cetera. So the Green New Deal has moved from a fringe proposal backed by people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, and the squad of DSA, that's Democratic Socialists of America, aligned Democratic politicians, to become the almost common sense vision of most of the Democratic Party, the, the current ruling party in America. Um, even Sleepy Joe, the nickname Sleepy Joe Biden, has surprised us on this, uh, working closely with Bernie Sanders to govern far to the left of what he actually ran, the platform he ran on in terms of expanding government services and aid. Uh, and it was only in April of this year, this is happening now and is, is very recent, but AOC, Alexandria Cortez, uh, introduced House Resolution 332, which recognizes the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal. So this is not a bill, but it's a resolution that's intended to kind of create a broad framework and a vision for transitioning to a green economy and creating green jobs. So although this failed in the Senate, uh, more than a dozen pieces of legislation embracing this framework and dealing with topics from transportation, immigration, electrical grid, and agricultural resilience have already been introduced. And in fact, we just got back from the summer break are being debated right now. So predictably, this has been denounced by the right as one, one um, rep representative from Kentucky called it a, a socialist super package, which will only saddle hardworking taxpayers with debt and displace millions of Americans from their jobs. So of course, it's like, in many ways, a dream come true for the right, all their fears and bugaboos about cultural Marxism, creeping socialism, environmental issues being a watermelon, green on the outside and red on the inside, seem to be coming true. And none other than Joe Biden is pushing this. So um, the right is having a field day with this. The Green New Deal has become a core organizing theme of the Democratic Socialists of America organization, which um, as mentioned, I, I'm, I'm a member of. It's, the, it's also been revived, this group has been revived by the Bernie Sanders campaign, but also the, the, the basic frustrations of especially a generation of young people that will never have the kind of opportunities and standard of life that their parents or grandparents even had under contemporary capitalism. So this is the largest kind of contemporary left group in the United States with 70,000 members and chapters in every state in the union. And although 70,000 obviously sounds like a drop in the bucket, it's, um, it has an influence beyond its numbers. People like AOC and Rashida Tlaib are members. So there's a direct pipeline from kind of the socialist intellectual left into people who are now have the ear of 
arguably the most powerful man in the world and who are you know, drafting laws and legislation with a explicitly eco-socialist content. Um, the, so the, a little bit of the history of the DSA, I mean, it was founded in the 70s and it used to be a pretty narrow, like electorally focused group. It was kind of the left wing of the Democratic Party, but that was quite changed in 2016 with the Bernie Sanders campaign, as many people were very reluctant Democratic voters. And when, you know, Clinton and the DNC kind of conspired to tank that campaign. A lot of people were like, you know, fuck you to the DNC. And it's a much more broad social movement organization now. It does run candidates and have an electoral component. It also has a very large libertarian socialist caucus, which is mostly anarchists and other people who have very little interest in working through the state. So it's kind of a big tent left organization. Um, and it's been an important player in popularizing the Green New Deal, but also things like Medicare for All and a variety of other kind of working class socialist uh, policies associated with AOC and the squad, Rashida Tlaib, Ilan Omar, and Ayanna Presley and some others. So it was like a new generation, mostly women, mostly women of color, um, legislators who identify as eco-socialists. So this is also quite new because the environmental movement in the United States has for a long time been dominated by mostly white people and white people of a certain class background. So the, the grassroots climate justice movement has also been important in popularizing this, this framing, this discourse, especially groups like Extinction Rebellion and the Sunrise Movement. They've taken on the GND as like a main, uh, that's Green New Deal, as a main framing. And they've been using direct action tactics to pressure Democrats and also corporate leaders um, to endorse the plan. Other groups focus more on non-state mutual aid networks. For example, the Symbiosis Network is a new uh, North American confederation that the Institute for Social Ecology helped launch just a few years ago. Um, it's comprised of member groups like Cooperation Jackson, like a directly democratic anti-capitalist mutual aid group in Jackson, Mississippi, and Black Socialists of America and some other organizations. And Symbiosis focuses more on building forms of anti-capitalist and directly democratic dual power rather than working through the electoral system, operating with a critique of capitalism, but also the state. Uh, here in Europe, I mean, I mentioned I live in Germany, the Ende Gelände movement has, that maybe some of you heard of or participated in has been doing really excellent coordinated mass action to keep fossil fuels in the ground. So kind of reviving the kind of occupation, direct action tactics of the 90s and the aughts, but updating it with more of an anti-capitalist bent. And they've done this during the pandemic. They did it this summer and uh, I think in Cologne and they've had participants joining them from across Europe. And now they're also starting to pop up um, in other places. I know Czechia had, um, uh, and the Galenda movement there. And I think Poland is doing some stuff. So something to keep an eye on. Um, the Umsganza Coalition is another interesting German uh, network, I would say, of actors, mostly German, but from other places in Europe. They're in fact doing a blockade this weekend in Munich of the uh, international car fair and framing it around against car capitalism. And that's a, it's, it's a really interesting kind of merger, I would say, of two tendencies that had previously, both in the United States and in Germany, worked more or less separately, the radical environmental movement and then the kind of more an, urban anti-capitalist and like Marxist movements. Those are increasingly coming together. And I see that as a very positive development. So I encourage you all to check out both of these groups. Another one is Top Berlin, which works on building international and anti-national left. Uh, in the UK, a group called Plan C does really interesting work, um, anti-austerity work from an anti-capitalist perspective. So these are some of the Europe, European movement reference points that I find most promising and interesting in this regard. Can we do one time here? Okay. So these groups have begun to successfully articulate an ecological politics for the working class, which is also the title of one of the two texts that I recommended. This one is by Matt Huber for a pretty cool journal, recent new journal called Catalyst. That's like a socialist and eco-socialist journal. Um, much like the Gilets Jaunes or the Yellow Vests in France, I think there's been really exciting work done in recent years to finally kill a lingering anti-working class bias within much of, the, much of the environmental movement. Namely, this means the longstanding habit of moralistically reducing environmental problems to individual consumption patterns or blaming people for being stuck in social systems they really have no control over. I think the Gilets Jaunes and protesting the gas tax really quickly, like a lot of environmental groups suddenly like, okay, yeah, you're right, which was, a, I think, a really salutary um, good thing to see happen. 
So in both cases, this brand of ecological politics was in many regards oppositional to the working class majority and framed environmental politics um, or environmental problems in ways that let the real culprits off the hook. Uh, as we know from the Carbon Majors report a few years back, they've usefully highlighted that the richest 1% emits 175 times more carbon per person on average than the poorest 10%, uh, while other research has shown that 100 global companies are responsible for almost two thirds of all greenhouse gases since the mid 19th century including just 50 companies, both private and state owned, that are responsible for fully half of all today's industrial emissions. So to focus on individual consumption patterns really misses the boat in important ways here, yet that's largely what environmental um, political discourse on the left has done um, for much of its short history. Um, so while the world's most vulnerable people are disproportionately impacted by droughts, floods, violent storms, and rising sea levels, the responsibility clearly falls on the world's wealthiest. And this, I'm, I'll just add, is really the kind of basic insight of Murray Bookchin, who is the, the co-founder of the Institute for Social Ecology and kind of the main thinker of social ecology. His kind of core insight is that the ecological crisis is a social crisis, and it can't be resolved without an alternative economic, social, political system. And we're going to hear more on this, uh, I think, this weekend, and more specifically on capitalism from Stravko later today. Okay, so this is the, the left response and the left vision. What about the right? They obviously have a very different vision in mind. Can you guys still hear me with the sirens out there? Makes me feel kind of like I'm in New York. I like it. So the right has a different ecological vision in mind. As it becomes increasingly impossible to ignore the current crisis of capitalism in the natural world, uh, it's increasingly abandoning climate denialism in favor of eco-fascism. And this is something that I've, uh, one of the, the other texts that I suggested was a, a book chapter I wrote a few years ago about eco-fascism in the United States. So you can check that out online. So I define eco-fascism as groups and ideologies that offer authoritarian and or racist um, analyses and solutions to environmental problems. So this really has been increasingly prominent in the last few years because of the Christchurch and the El Paso shootings, both of which had left manifestos that were explicitly eco-fascist, blaming environmental problems on immigrants and on Mexicans and Muslims and whatnot. Um, but I would say it's also it's not restricted to either lone wolf actors or to state actors, which was kind of the earlier I would say connotation of eco-fascism. Um, it draws on widespread ideas about nature as the ultimate justification for hierarchy, competition, and might makes right, which really are um, much more prevalent than the tip of the iceberg being explicit eco-fascist actors or discourse might suggest. So unsurprisingly, the right responds to ecological crisis with their same answer to other problems, walls, borders, and exclusion maintained by violence and elites. Young right-wingers today are growing up in a world where environmentalism has in many ways been normalized. So they can translate the war on terror and anti-immigrant rhetoric into ecological rhetoric. Uh, the whiteness of the environmental movement, as well as its romantic tendencies, makes it very attractive uh, to the far right, especially those uh, who are critical of traditional conservatism who tend to deny climate change. Um, the rise of post-ideological politics, mystical new age politics, and conspiracy theories has greatly expanded kind of the, the potential audience for these ideas, um, especially for an eco-fascist politics that often claims to be neither left nor right. So this post-political, post-ideological sentiment that neoliberalism helped foster really, um, I would say, creates a positive, receptive environment for these ideas. And although eco-fascist um, discourse poses as a critique of the amoral, global, cosmopolitan, mongrelizing forces of neoliberal capitalism, it in fact simply radicalizes capitalism's ethos of scarcity, uh, of austerity, and competition. It just gives it a radical form. So it's, it, we could call it then the eco-socialism of fools, just as August Babel said that anti-Semitism was the socialism of fools. It draws on the tradition of reactionary anti-capitalism, ranging from various backward-looking communitarianisms, exclusionary ethno-nationalisms, 
mystical forms of ecology to apocalyptic survivalism. These are just a few of the kind of new tendencies that eco-fascist discourse draws on. Uh, these actors are also very consciously trying to rehabilitate the early racist origins of ecology that today many are unaware of from the racist German naturalist Ernst Haeckel, who in fact is the guy who coined the term uh, ecology, who was a precursor to German romantic nationalism and Hitler, to deep ecology, which we typically think of as a left ideology, but in the 1980s in the US advocated against immigration and praised HIV as you know thinning out human population, to the early American conservationist Madison Grant, who wrote um, a book called The Passing of the Great Race in 1916 that had a conservationist protect nature from the hordes of immigrants uh, orientation, which Hitler read and wrote to him and said, I love your book. It's become my Bible. It's a very direct influence on the Holocaust. Um, so in fact, the eco-fascist right has a strong claim to the legacy of environmental thought, and they're reviving its Malthusian population focus and its general focus on limits and on natural order and drawing out the inherently nationalist and in many ways racist implications of these ideas. And this is another area I'll just mention that the Institute for Social Ecology has really specialized in. My colleague Peter Staudenmeier and Janet Beal um, wrote the book Ecofascism Lessons from the German Experience, which um, outside of Germany, many people just aren't aware of this history of the ecological wing of the Nazi party and um, these kind of romantic reactionary right wing critiques of capitalism. When I read this, you know, in the 90s, I was like, oh, it kind of blew my mind. I had no idea. And then, of course, Bookchin, you know, he's, he's been a key figure in arguing against misanthropic and technocratic forms of ecology. Um, he wrote his book, Our Synthetic Environment in 1962. It came out briefly before Rachel Carson's book, Silent Str Spring, which is the book credited with kind of launching the modern ecology movement. And that was only in 1962. So the kind of idea of uh, environmentalism being a discourse of the left is a very, very modern phenomenon. We tend to think, forget it has a much longer history, and most of that history was very patrician, upper class, white, European, and, and racist. Um, and again, this was something that Bookchin had taken aim at. You know, he wrote a, a pamphlet in 1964 called Ecology and Revolutionary Thought, which was really responsible for introducing ecology into the radical left. And it was not taken for granted. It was many ways people mocked him and made fun of him. Even unorthodox leftists like the Situationists, when he came in 1968 to meet them in France, they called him Smokey the Bear Anarchist because who the fuck cares about trees and bears and the environment? That's not a left issue. We only care about the working class. Um, so happily, he's you know been part of shifting that tide in the last 40 years. So a lot of those ideas that he outlined in 1964 are now the common sense of the left. So unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic has provided an excellent platform for eco-fascist discourse to become more widespread. In the early days, it was very common to hear this idea that humans are the virus and uh, or that the coronavirus was nature's way of returning to balance or getting revenge on an arrogant humanity. So this, this misanthropic idea of a degenerate, corrupted, decadent humanity in general is a key talking point for right-wing environmental discourse. And previously, though, it was, it was associated, as I mentioned, with ostensibly left groups like Earth First and Deep Green Resistance and other kind of radical environmental groups. We could look at a few other recent examples on the left. Um, the website Common Dreams had this article that posited that COVID-19 was nature's response to human transgression. An article in Psychology Today described it as evidence of mother nature turning it up a notch on humans who refuse to listen. So in many ways, this is a very tempting, I told you so impulse for the left. But I would argue that A, anthropomorph anthropomorphizing nature in this way is a very dangerous Thing. Assume, you know, projecting human intentions and politics onto the natural world is always kind of a, a dicey endeavor. Um, and B, it usually goes in an anti-humanist rather than emancipatory direction. So I would say that this, I told you so, nature getting its revenge is not a good um, framing of coronavirus. And that's why the right has taken it up. And when you start hearing your talking points coming back to you from the right, it's probably time to you know, reconsider some of these things. Um, although it came out in, in 2019, Michael Moore produced one of his last movies was called um, Planet of the Humans, which made a very similar point. It blamed an undifferentiated humanity um, for our ecological problems. 
I would say that the Anthropocene concept does this as well. I'm glad that people like Jason Moore are talking about the Capitalocene to talk about, it's not just humanity, it's capitalism and it's other very specific forms of social relations that are responsible for ecological problems, not just humanity in general. This is, um, you know, on the one hand, this has been the centrist and technocratic approach of the Club of Rome, but it's also increasingly taken up by, by the right. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the problem with this is it's not just some geological age that's characterized by negative human impact, but it needs to be specified which humans and what kinds, what specific kinds of societies have produced these problems. Um, another example is the popular BBC documentarian, David Attenborough. Um, everybody, a lot of people have seen his Planet Earth films. They're very beautiful films, but unfortunately they have this kind of kicker at the end that again, shifts our attention to the nature of the problem being population rather than capitalism, colonialism, neo-colonial extraction regimes, et cetera. So these narratives to a large extent resonate with eco-fascism because their shared emphasis on population growth directs blame onto the non-white global South while ignoring the outsized consumption of uh, Northern populations, which are static or in decline. Obviously we are the ones responsible for more consumption, not we as people, as I mentioned, but our societies and our populations are you know, static or in decline. So this population narrative is a complete dead end, <clears throat> except for the right. Um, this brand of Malthusian population ecology also resonates with the great replacement theory that white Europeans are being outbred by non-whites and Muslims, also referred to on the right as white genocide theory. One of the more recent popularizers of this discourse um, on the right was the Finnish deep ecologist Peti Linkola, who died, I think, last year. Um, and he's been you know, taken up as kind of the seer and the ecological thinker of the right. We were talking last night with Katerina about um, a local right winger whose buddies and a, a, a prominent writer on countercurrents, which is one of the main global far right platforms. And they, this, this Greg Johnson identifies as a deep ecologist and an eco-fascist. In fact, he's working on a book on eco-fascism and he's really very consciously trying to inject eco-fascist ideas into the global right, which sadly in many ways um, is as organized or more organized and more networked than the left, even though it often happens more only in academic or intellectual circles. So the, my book chapter that I, I put out there as a, um, um, a suggested reading <clears throat> looks at U.S. examples and also kind of takes a more theoretical approach, but for a, a really great overview of European examples, I recommend the book it's a part of um, by my colleague Bernard Forschner. It's called The Far Right and the Environment. So uh, I don't know if there's actually a Macedonian chapter, but I think there's a chapter on Serbia and a bunch of other European examples, which here, of course, there's like the movement element, but because of the more porous uh, parliamentary structure, it's also more common for parties to take up these ideas here than in the US. So the further right and the more violent the group, for example, groups like the base and the Adam Waffen division, these are like outright kill people and do terrorist acts type far right groups, the more enthusiastic is their embrace of eco-fascism. This is kind of a, an, an interesting new trend on the far right. It's often articulated as an accelerationist ideology. Uh, meaning that they want to accelerate social crisis and create a collapse so that you can then have this purifying rebirth of a, of a, a white right society. And this, this uh, idea of it has to get worse before it gets better also has some crossover far left, far right appeal. You've probably heard some of this in, um, from lefties as well. And groups like the Adam Waffen Division, one of the worst of the bunch, have embraced figures like the Unabomber, who were previously kind of, he was previously kind of the hero of the radical environmental movement. And now the right is taking him on. Uh, there's been some disturbing examples of environmental and left-wing activists kind of crossing over. An, an Earth Liberation Front prisoner named Nathan Exile Block became an, a, a neo-pagan neo-nazi while in prison and is now a julius evola spouting mystical fascist um one of the most prominent adam waffen division members this guy william stotzer uh, was previously an earth first member and a tree sitter so there are some strange um, crossovers between some of these ideologies and actors and since anti-authoritarianism is one of the the themes for this weekend um, I want to suggest that we should be wary of some of these new confused anti-authoritarian crossovers between left and right that um, uh, unfortunately often will uh, unite under this vague slogan of fuck the system which system what do we mean by that 
Um, we, we need to have more rigor in our analysis so that we do not end up nodding along or reproducing the talking points of this, um, they, in German, they call it the querfront, the left-right crossover um, movement. And one of the more recent convergences is the so-called conspirituality movement, which is a marriage of conspiracy theory and spirituality. Conspirituality, it's a synthesis of conspiracy, spirituality, anti-vax, sometimes veganism, and alternative health strands that have been gaining ground for years and have really taken off um, since the pandemic. A lot of these groups, for example, one of the main guys in Germany, he's, um, he's an immigrant and he's a vegan chef, kind of a popular chef, and he's been leading the anti-vaccine protest there. Um, one of the main uh, organizers in New Zealand is a Maori guy. Um, so these are kind of unsettling our understandings of who far right actors are. And that's one of the beauties of their idea of ethno pluralism, you know, a white ethno state for the whites, you can have people of color ethno states here and there, you know, they've, in some cases, they're fluid about their supremacist versus, you know, um, ethno pluralist live side by side, but separately commitments. So this is something we need to keep an eye on. Maybe some of you are aware or have saw, seen the pictures of the alt-right shaman, um, who is one of the guys photographed a lot in the, the yeah, the, the storming, the, the insurrection on the Capitol in the United States. He was the guy bare chested with the face paint and the, the bison hat with the horns. I mean, this guy, Jake Agnelli, I mean, he was a former climate activist and a neo-pagan. So he's in a way, you know, he's a, he's part of the QAnon conspiracy theory, but he's a good symbol of this kind of weird overlap of various different um, political and quasi-political trends. These actors often articulate a very vague anti-systemic or anti-status or even anti-big business rhetoric, typically contrasted to the good small business. And these confused and conspiratorial views map closely onto tendencies that really took off in the Green Party in the 90s and the, two, and the 2000s, and in many cases were radicalized by the, the explosion of conspiracy theories that happened in the wake of 9-11. So that's been another kind of vector is this kind of crude anti-imperialism that is congealed with um, conspiracist thought, um, and especially around 9-11. It was an inside job. It was Mossad. We can also take that into an anti-Israel direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been a lot of loss of rigor in our analysis that has created openings to um, right-wing actors. Okay, so I've briefly outlined the left and the right challenges to traditional centrism in the current moment, but can the center hold, and if so, how? Um, shortly before his tragic and unexpected death, David Graeber, who many of you are probably familiar with, he was, he was a friend and someone I worked with, anarchist anthropologist, um, he wrote a piece that was just recently published in Jacobin magazine that likened the current COVID moment to awakening from a dream. He wrote, in reality, the crisis we just experienced was waking from a dream, a confrontation with the actual reality of human life, which is that we are a collection of fragile beings taking care of one another, and that those who do the lion's share of this care work that keeps us alive are overtaxed, underpaid, and daily humiliated, and that a very large proportion of the population don't do anything at all, but spin fantasies, extract rents, and generally get in the way of those who are making, fixing, moving, and transporting things, or tending to the needs of other living beings. He says, it's imperative that we do not slip back into a reality where all this makes some sort of inexplicable sense in the way senseless things often do in a dream. So despite the new openings to eco-socialism that I described above, there's every danger that this is exactly what's going to happen, this great reset, this going back to the way things were. And in this regard, I think we should really bear in mind this fantastic line from the uh, Giuseppe de Lampedusa novel, The Leopard, where it says, everything must change for everything to remain the same. I think this will become kind of the ruling mantra of the, the ruling class today. But as the saying goes, I don't know if you know this idiom or have a, a parallel one, but in English, we say the leopard can't change its spots. The leopard in this case being capitalism or the status quo. So after a generation of neoliberal hegemony, it can be very satisfying, at least for me, to hear terms like socialism and social democracy being widely used in the United States, which have never really had much of a purchase in the United States and certainly not for at least a generation. Um, but we should understand this phrase as a warning that the ruling class will do anything and everything it's best to manage the appearance of change 
without actually challenging the underlying social logic of capitalism. So for me, this underlies um, one of my main research and political interests, which is in co-optation, or as I prefer to call it, recuperation. Uh, recuperation I, I, I define as the, the process of incorporating oppositional movements and ideas into established modes of power. So although it's similar to concepts such as co-optation or greenwashing, which presume strategic action by elites to frustrate the political goals of movements, recuperation I, I theorize as a much more expansive and multi-directional process um, rather than a top-down affair where powerful actors are intentionally trying to just take ideas or people to protect their interests or stifle social change, recuperation can be sincere or cynical in its motivation, or more likely some combination of both. So you, it cannot be reduced to elite conspiracy. So this view disrupts simplistic conceptions of power that reinforce dichotomies between order and opposition or top-down and bottom-up. Instead, recuperation suggests that we must also view social movements as social resources, uh, which fulfill a variety of useful roles. They serve as a diagnostic function, as the vanguard of social conflict detection. In a way, they're the canaries in the coal mine that are, you know, figuring out where the winds are blowing, what some of the problems are. Uh, they also act as social and political entrepreneurs that offer new ideas, tools, and actors for addressing emergent social problems or meeting needs. And bonus, they do this, they provide these imaginative solutions to social problems free of charge. So we are seeing that right now, this translation of longstanding movement demands for a Green New Deal being taken up by these intermediary powers of AOC and the squad, and then percolating up to Biden's desk. What is going to happen in this process of translation? How can we keep our eyes on the prize so that it's not a bait and switch? So I don't know if any of you are familiar with Luke Boltonsky and Yves Chiapello's book, uh, The New Spirit of Capitalism, came out in 2000 in French and 2005 in English, but they offer a really instructive theorization of recuperation. They basically explain how elements of the, the, the French New Left's artistic critique of capitalism, and especially of the kind of hierarchical, uh, soul-deadening office environments of Fordism, um, basically that the, the French firms and corporate culture had to lure the 68 generation back into the workforce by creating the kind of modern neoliberal um, work culture of decentralization, more autonomy, casual Friday, um, more self-directed projects, more autonomy, et cetera, all of which started out as demands, you know, even from like socialists in the left for a more humane form of socialism. This was happening under socialist regimes in Europe and France in particular, but unintentionally created this new spirit of capitalism, to use Weber's term, a new spirit of capitalism that became neoliberalism. So if even like the most radical 68 critics can be the vanguard of neoliberalism, we have to think, what, what can we do? What are we going to do? We have to anticipate new forms of recuperation because the history of left social movements is also the history of recuperation from the incorporation of the workers' movement into capitalism through unions and social democratic parties um, to the more recent repackaging of the anti-globalization and Occupy movements as ethical consumption or as anti-statist communitarian mutual aid projects that are almost indistinguishable from charity. So neo-anarchism, which I would say would encompass these latter movements of Occupy and the ultra-globalization movement, was itself a response to recuperation. First, there was an attempt to build a radical left that was free of the taint of Stalinist authoritarianism on the one hand, and on the other, the total absorption of social democratic parties and unions on the other. We have to remember it was mostly, mostly social democratic parties from Europe to Brazil who've been the handmaidens of neoliberalism and austerity. So their approach was to articulate this prefigurative politics which rejected the state in favor of direct action. Yet they too fell victim to the cunning of history. So my own doctoral research focused on how the neo-anarchist movements of the 90s and 2000s um, were basically, specifically the ultra-globalization movement and Occupy, were recuperated in part due to their unrealized resonances and affinities with neoliberalism. On the one hand, we can see, you know, if you stroll into, in America, Whole Foods, or we could say here, maybe a Starbucks, you go there and you see all this discourse of ethical consumption, right? It's basically the language of movements of the 90s and aughts 
being regurgitated back at us in a commodified form. So my arguments and, and my dissertation and the book was basically that social movement actors were unable to translate this desire for a more ethical and ecological world on their own. So capitalist actors took this and commodified it and took it back, sold it to us in a repackaged commodified form as ethical consumption and corporate social responsibility. If you look at the discourse of movements and Capitalism today, they're almost identical, which is quite shocking, but in a way not shocking because those movements had a very strong premium on individual lifestyle and consumption patterns, going insane, reading the back of you know all the ingredients to make sure they're vegan and not and sourced locally, all this shit that now you can do at a Whole Foods. And that's, that's the whole niche market, the expansion. Capitalism will try to save itself by giving you that supposedly pure ethical product, which we know can't actually exist. Um, another example would be Occupy Sandy, which was the kind of later reincarnation of the Occupy Wall Street movement. After Occupy Wall Street was kicked out of the park, Zuccotti Park in New York and parks across America, and in fact, the world, um, in 2012, it was reborn as a response to the superstorm Sandy, which hit the Eastern seaboard in the United States. And they basically re used their skills and networks of feeding and housing thousands of people in camps to help these storm victims. <clears throat> so you had this very strange um, situation where FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and cops were arriving late to the scene where anarchists were already here feeding and housing and helping people. And at one point, even taking orders from Occupy activists, which is quite odd. And at one point, even chanting together, another world is possible, together we're unstoppable with cops and FEMA, which is odd. So even the much hated Orwellian sounding um, Office of Homeland Security that Bush created published a report that praised Occupy Sandy. This report was titled The Resilient Social Network. And it noted that unlike traditional disaster response organizations, there was no appointed leaders, no bureaucracy, no regulations to follow, no predefined mission or strategic plan. There was just pure relief. So this turned towards you know, direct action mutual aid resonated with many of the values of neoliberalism, even if it was framed as an anti neoliberal response. So the report, in fact, concluded that we can learn lessons from Occupy Sandy's successes to ensure a ready and resilient nation. So obviously, something is very, very strange when the federal government of the United States is praising self described anarchist revolutionaries. But such anti-statist communitarian politics became increasingly attractive, not only to the left, but to the right in this period. And I argue because they both offered a glimpse of a potentially emergent new spirit of capitalism that was well suited to the, the needs of zombie neoliberalism. Zombie neoliberalism being that, you know, the crisis of neoliberalism in 2008, it creates this massive collapse. And yet, what do we get? More neoliberalism. In fact, Occupy Wall Street didn't emerge the left response to the crisis took a year. It was the right that in America initially responded, arguably saying what we needed was even more deregulation. So we had the Tea Party. That was the initial response to the financial crisis. And it was quite strange that Occupy Wall Street, which built on the critiques and even the ideas and some of the people of the alter globalization movement, which had literally targeted neoliberalism from the 90s to the 2000s, was nowhere to be seen. I would say this is also because of some unrecognized affinities in these anti-statist discourses. And that's not to just uncritically laud the state either. Okay. So, and the other thing I would add about this is that, you know, this zombie neoliberalism approach, social movements in turn provided the welfare and social reproduction duties that the state had abandoned. But instead of legitimating it in the, in the name of austerity as they previously had, you do it in the, the language of empowerment and autonomy and social movements, all these good things. So on this view, even ostensibly radical social movements can play a role in legitimizing and restabilizing capitalism. I mean, this isn't surprising. Already in 1848, Karl Marx stated that cooperatives, which in many ways were the radical horizon of Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Sandy, in fact, Occupy Sandy activists tried to set up worker-owned cooperatives to kind of rebuild in the wake of the storm. Already in 1848, um, Marx warned why those members of the ruling classes who are intelligent enough to perceive the impossibility of continuing the present system, and they are many, have become 
the obtrusive and full-mouthed apostles of cooperative production. So he's saying, even in 1848, he saw co-op as a way, private property, we can save that, but we just have to give workers a little bit more control in the workplace, but we're still gonna organize as you know, competitive capitalist industries. And Murray Bookchin would warn much later, he would say, there's nothing that can't be at least hypothetically co-opted, including anarchism. So if on the one hand, we have the unions and Bernie and Corbyn as kind of the social democratic trajectory of recuperation, then we have the Occupy Wall Street um, experience as the neo-anarchist trajectory of recuperation, what new forms are we going to face in the present? Will the Green New Deal and the care economy be used to save capitalism just as the New Deal and social democracy did in the aftermath of the Great Depression? So such concerns, I think, animate many of the most interesting critiques of the Green New Deal that we're seeing today. On the one hand, Green New Deal is a, it's an improvement over the previous, we could say, end of pipe um, politics, where you don't, you don't look at production, you just look at the end of pipe and like how you redistribute those goods or the environmental impact of those goods. So it's, it's usefully redirecting us to production and how production takes place. But does it challenge the why, the why of production? why it takes place. So in trying to overcome this previous very boring dichotomy of jobs versus the environment, by synthesizing them, we'll, we'll save the environment by creating green jobs. The Green New Deal discourse can also easily remain trapped in the existing capitalist paradigm, um, simply made ecologically efficient. So some critiques that are happening now, even are, in fact on the floor of Congress, which again is very surprising, They've criticized the industrial reindustrialization paradigm of the Green New Deal, and some are trying to shift this into the more um, feminist and low carbon care economy, that this is what we need to lift up, not creating solar power um, and you know, green energy infrastructure. This is a current debate that's happening. Even Joe Biden, quite shockingly, in the recent weeks, um, talked about the caring economy. He got it wrong, but you know, he probably heard it from AOC or somebody else, which is Again, interesting to hear it just coming from the lips of these, these people. Um, the current trend of increased government spending also highlights problems with universal basic income, uh, which has, of course, been a demand or a debate on the left. But absent broader social reorganization, of course, this could just provide an IV drip that keeps capitalism alive. So we have to keep this in mind as well. OK. So I'm Okay, longer than I thought. So I'm, I'm gonna wrap up here. So both capitalism and the left, which confront it, have undergone dramatic transformations in the last 20 years. As both power and social change are moving targets, recuperation always takes place within an ever-changing historical and political context. So for this reason, the strategies movements avoid, excuse me, adopt to avoid recuperation in one era might facilitate it in another. So these observations underscore perhaps the most important factor in understanding recuperation, the incredible dynamism of capitalism itself. Stable core features like commodity production, uh, excuse me, commodity exchange, private property, and the profit motive exist alongside a systemic imperative which impels ceaseless change in the pursuit of innovation, accumulation, and market dominance. The result, according to Marshall Berman, a great Marxist author, you should all read his book that this is from, um, All That Solid Melts Into Air. He wrote in the 80s, movements that proclaim their hostility to capitalism may be just the sort of stimulants capitalism needs. Bourgeois society, through its insatiable drive for destruction and development, and its need to satisfy the insatiable needs it creates, inevitably produces radical ideas and movements that aim to destroy it. But its very capacity for development enables it to negate its own inner negations, its own inner movements and enemies, to nourish itself and thrive on opposition, to become stronger amid pressure and crisis than it could ever be in peace, to transform hostility into intimacy and attackers into inadvertent allies. I think it's a, it's a beautiful characterization of this process of recuperation. So as a result, capitalism has proven to be far more flexible and durable than either its critics or its proponents probably imagined. As the organization of power changes, so must our critique. In this regard, critical theory can play a really important clarifying role. Um, Boltanski and Chiapello, who I mentioned before, described this process. Partially attended to and integrated on certain points, circumvented or countered on others, critique must constantly shift and forged new weapons. 
it must continually resume its analysis in order to stay as close as possible to the properties that characterize the capitalism of its time. So while there's no silver bullet, which is going to enable us to avoid recuperation entirely, as close attention to evolving power relations, and in particular to how oppositional ideas and actors have been incorporated into the status quo, can help us make sure that left movements and left theory remain critical instead of becoming affirmative. So to retain our analytical power and our political relevance, we must continually reconsider our relationship to the highly dynamic an ever-evolving cap ever evolving capitalist world that we inhabit and continually ask what political demands might, de might negate its anti-utopian insistence that there is and can be no alternative. Okay, that's it. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. All right, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, so we now have about an hour and 15 minutes for a discussion on Blair's lecture, and as well as a sort of general conversation, depending on uh, where it moves. Um, so I guess we'll just start off. Uh, if there's anybody who has any questions, uh, if you're online, you can raise your hand in the Zoom room um, or just unmute yourself. Your presentation. Uh... Uh, if uh, some common Macedonian can, has listened to your presentation, it, it will have uh, some cultural shock. Okay. Uh, because uh, here you are an American and speaking uh, against cap against capitalism, and not uh, just about uh, how bad is Trump and Biden for Macedonian context life and uh, and Gruevski and Mitskovsk. Uh, people are here unaccustomed to, to problematize capitalism. They have uh, some uh, idolized uh, view about the West. And I will uh, tell you the main points of their idol idolized picture. And uh, I want uh, your answer how much you think it is true. For example, they think that uh, all people in the West uh, are more uh, affluent than here, that uh, there is no, there is uh, democracy there, uh, uh, and here we don't have. Mm -hmm. And that uh, their people are enamorated in capitalism. So what what is your opinion? Is this... Uh, uh, main political views about uh, perception of the West through uh, the familiarity with those discussions. I would say it's not limited to Macedonia. I would say most people in America, it's very narrow, you know, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, and a very tired kind of dichotomy. Um, and, and as I noticed or noted, though, that's starting to change because of the rise of a socialist perspective that has challenged that. And, you know, a lot of the credit has to go to Bernie Sanders for putting out a very different kind of politics from the kind of classical liberalism, which, you know, or American neoliberalism of like Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton for that matter of, you know, neoliberal economics, free markets, you know, thin democracy plus identity politics versus this like working class pro social support, um, policies of Sanders. That's really transformed the political landscape pretty radically, and it's and it's quite recent. So, um, as to the differences, and we talked a little bit about this last night over dinner, and this kind of like interesting difference that in the United States, the kind of post two thousand eight generation, especially of young people, have grown up in a in a context where they realize they their life chances are far worse than their parents. And they will probably never own a house. They'll never pay off their student loans. I've, I've defaulted on my student loans. I owe about $90,000 in student loans. I'll never pay it back. I just ignore it. But that means I probably couldn't get a, a loan to own a house, for example, or many other things. And that's not any different from millions of other um, people. So uh, this has put, it, it wasn't like, you know, reading a DSA pamphlet that made people socialists or millions of Americans more sympathetic to it. It was the fact they have no health care. They're locked into dead end, low wage service industry jobs, the kinds that have proliferated under neoliberalism for 40 years. Um, so it's put class politics back on the table. Of course, a very tiny percentage of people in the United States 
we can even say, of course, like the 1%, but we could even expand that to, there is a, a dwindling middle class that are quite comfortable and affluent, et cetera, but their children are not. Um, I mean, if, again, a few of them are, that's, that's the, the truth of, of class analysis, right? No matter where you are, whether it's Macedonia or America, we live in class societies where some people do well and some people do poorly. And there tend to be, there's more that do poorly than, than do well. And it's recognizing that that is not a matter of corruption or exceptions to the rule. That is the, the nature of the system. So um, I guess that would be my answer is that don't look to America for um, as your a future or as, you know, the land where all is good. No, like, in fact, people are looking elsewhere. I mean, I, I know we've talked about there's a lot of nostalgia and Yugostalgia here and in, in Germany for the East. You know, where, okay, it was authoritarian, top down, in some ways, brutal regimes, but at least you had healthcare and a flat for cheap. Well, of course, we don't want that to be our horizon. It can't be our horizon, but it's, you know, it's uh, the, the best of the worst or something. It's something in recent memory that people can look to. Of course, we want a more utopian and libertarian socialist um, society where we don't have social security and social support at the expense of democracy and the expense of um, individual fulfillment and individual rights. So maybe if we look at the longer scope of history, we can balance this kind of old school Fordist, we could say either the social democratic or even the Soviet models with the kind of neoliberal course correction, which as I mentioned, really did start as a demand of the left. I mean, you can point to like Friedrich von Hayek and the Mont Pelerin Society, these neoliberal thinkers, the Chicago School as providing the framework for neoliberalism and neoclassical economics, that's true. But it also emerged as a demand from the left in the United States, in France, in many places for socialism with a human face, for a more autonomous and democratic form of um, socialism, which then happened to um, gain steam at the same time of the crisis of capitalism in the 1970s that paved the way for neoliberalism. neoliberalism. So it wasn't just a right-wing project, it was a right and a left project. So hopefully I, I maybe answer that. And as to the democracy question, I mean, of course, yes, we have some thin formalized democracy and maybe, you know, I think in Europe and especially Eastern and Southeastern Europe, there's this sense of like, oh, they're all corrupt. And of course, everyone hates politicians no matter where they are. The difference in the United States, although we still, of course, have constant political scandals of various kinds, we also just have the more um, institutionalized corruption of lobbying and um, you know, like Marx said a long time ago, that the state is the executive arm of the bourgeoisie. So that poses some very serious institutional constraints. And we've, we've seen that even now with people like Sanders, who, um, you know, if you follow them on Instagram, they're trying to fight for a variety of these reforms. And again, not to uncritically just say, oh, Sanders is the answer. But he has done a good job of highlighting there's class interests who are opposed to you as a American working class person having health care that um, you've never had before. There are class interests opposed to you having subsidized child care so that you have to not, you know, have to don't have to choose between a job and a family. That's another aspect to like the millennial angst is like realizing they can't afford to have kids under their shitty jobs. And, you know, it's changing their whole like lifestyle, et cetera. So there's these social reproductive um, you know, there's a feminist aspect to the critique of capitalism as well. And I, and I will say that um, the squad and AOC and the, and the, the um, DSA have done a pretty good job of putting these ecological feminist things together. It's not the end all be all, but it's changed the conversation in a way that's quite novel and creates a space where at least we're speaking the same language and we have some shared coordinates that we can then push for more more radical alternatives because obviously if you're arguing with neoliberals or neoconservatives it's a very different conversation if we're already debating what a green new deal might look like then we can start to address some of its you know valid critiques and shortcomings okay sorry i'll try to be less long-winded to the questions all right uh thanks for that response uh is there anyone else that has a question Yeah, if there's anyone in the Zoom, just raise your hand or unmute yourself. Peter? Yes, thank you. Hello. Well, I 
I would like to express a kind of reserve toward the title of uh, this uh, discussion uh, because I don't understand why the whole ecological problem of the planet is uh, reduced just to uh, climate change and all other even bigger problems are neglected and not only here but i see it as a trend all global trend that we all the time speak only about climate change and everything else is forgotten or far behind it so i didn't expect also here to discuss about climate change so this is my question now for all but uh, what do you see as kind of the uh, the other issues that are equally or more important? I mean, it's true that's been the framing and that's what mostly talked about. And that's seems to be the kind of overarching existential threat. But of course, there's you can break it down into other things. So I'm curious what you think is missing or what does climate discourse miss that's important for you? Then the global uh, the destruct, destruction of global uh, ecosystem, ecosystems. So I agree with uh, Sir Attenborough, David Attenborough, with his standpoint that we people are too many and are doing too much damage to this planet. And it is so obvious and I'm uh, wondering why we cannot see it. And I also uh, see in your explanations that you think it's a minor problem, the growth of human population is something not uh, very much in your focus, but you think the class problem and so on, uh, capitalism, overproduction, and so on, but you don't see that all this is possible, is happening because of the demand, the needs of such a big population. So, uh, and as a result, and, and as a consequence of uh, too many people on the planet, we have a, a very big production of, on, of all kinds of goods. And also we are uh, distracting the, all kinds of uh, ecosystem, starting with the water, woods, forests, and so on, and so on. And we are also taking the living uh, space of other species. So in the last 50 or 100 uh, years, we practically uh, destroyed uh, half of the uh, of, uh, species of the planet. I, I, I see your point, I think. And yeah, I think that's a, a it's probably an actual disagreement. Um, I do think population is pointing us very much in the wrong direction. I mean, I don't I don't want to come across sounding like some pronatalist that just more the merrier. I think, you know, what causes populations to go down is education and access to the means of social life and reproductive health. So, you know, the places that have declining or static birth rates are you know North America and Europe, um, where there's a certain level of of development education where people can control family size, whereas you know in other you know mostly agricultural societies, more bodies means more workers and more whatnot. So there's like there's a, a social 
pressure to have more kids that we need to challenge that in order to a even if we accept that as a problem but the second point is if you you know the united states is one of the biggest consumers of resources in the world and if you've ever driven across the united states you'll see it's largely empty there's huge tracts of land where no people live very low population density most of the eastern seaboard of the united states was clear cut with hand tools with a very small population to you know, create commodities for capitalism, not to support a growing population. Um, so I think that this this gets it backwards. And you can see the same thing in the Mediterranean, you know, being deforested to build ships um, long before there was a huge population. So I really think that population is is the wrong framing, um, and especially when it starts getting into this discussion of natural limits and carrying capacity, which has been one of those long-standing ecological things. We are not just a, a, an animal population like any other. We interact with the environment in much more dynamic ways, mediated by social relationships. And it's that qualitative aspect, not the quantitative aspect, that I think is far more productive. And it points in ways that aren't telling people how many kids they can or should have. That, as we've seen, happens. That's a natural, not a natural, but that's a social byproduct of people having more access to, to wealth and education and resources to control family size and growth. I mean, that's my, that's my response, I suppose. Yes, I accept all of this, what you said about the social aspects, but uh, we cannot uh, deny that the big popula population of the planet is a threat for everything. First of all, for, for the pollution of the waters, for the pollution of the air, for destructing all kinds of ecosystem, forests, oceans, rivers, and so on. So we should uh, make a difference. Uh, it's One thing is what is right, what are the rights of the poor people who, who have the need to uh, proliferate because of already known all the reasons. But on the other side, we have an explosion of population and we uh, cannot wait till all the people have a decent uh, living conditions and education, and then to start to uh, lower the population. Because the, the trend is that power uh, uh, poor nations, Poor people are everywhere. We are not uh, reaching the point where we can say everybody has the living standard which allows them to have one or two children. And then the population will start to lower. No, it, it is an explosion and we don't have the time because the planet has reached its limits, ecological limits. I guess I disagree with that too, because I think, um, well, those limits, we've, it doesn't all happen at once. It's like always an ongoing thing and, and our reactions no, to no, it no, no. are Excuse mediated. Me. By... Me. You, you should have in mind that this, all this process is uh, continuously running for 200 years and now it's the po point of no return so by your logic then the the chinese one child policy should have solved the problem right one of the most a very large population but it hasn't right because capitalism not because of population so just simply you know advocating for restrictive population measures on its own 
does not get at the problem. The problem, again, look at the United States, look at Europe. We are the net largest consumers. We have small populations relative. That just completely undermines the population arguments. It's, it's the wrong direction. And furthermore, as I said, it, it points in either on the one hand, state eco-fascist um, policies like no. China or far right ones where you know they can take up your arguments and say that's why we have to restrict immigrants that's why we have to put more limitations on women's bodies especially women of color's bodies so i just i find that a dead end and i think it's more productive to think about it as if we understand socialism as ideally a democratically directly democratically planned economy part of the planned economy or oikos also includes the household and includes biology and our, our metabolisms with each other so planning our family to me is also part of um planned economy okay well, maybe we should move on to another topic though so we don't just have a back and forth uh but thank you for that i think you know it's a good question we we disagree but completely uh, 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 you have a question okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Diana Taneska. Thank you for this lecture. Uh, congratulations uh, for organizing this event to my favorite institute. Um, I have uh, maybe it's an unrealistic question, but I want to go back to the, uh, to the beginning of your uh, lecture when you say going back to the branch going back to branch. Uh, you, you mean um, uh, going back uh, before Trump and before Corona? pandemic. Um, I'm wondering what would be uh, the biggest challenge um, or several of them, I don't uh, want to specify uh, how many. Uh, uh, in general, what do you think in the politics? Uh, what would be, uh, or in, in economy, uh, if we go back before Corona, uh, especially uh, what do you think um, this branch would um, or is happening now, is doing? Um, for the progressive uh, Democrats and for those who are in the center? And or am I just giving, uh, attaching the great importance of Corona on, on, on these issues? Um, it, it, yeah, it's a good question. And it's, it's hard to separate the kind of crisis of neoliberalism from now the crisis of COVID. And it's true that the, the back to brunch mentality was more a response to Trump. And let's just get this bad orange man, Cheeto Mussolini, out. I mean, it's really rotted liberals' minds in America quite severely that they can only understand things in this like highly personalistic manner of, yes, an especially disgusting, obnoxious human being in the form of Trump. But the problems are obviously more systemic. So this back to brunch meme was this kind of, you know, satire taking aim at like especially white middle upper middle class people who live mostly in cities who are just like can't we just go back to brunch and drink our mimosas in peace and let this etc but you know that's obviously not going to happen even without covid it wasn't going to happen because well as i mentioned their kids aren't going to let them do that um they, they can't afford brunch for one thing which you know tends to be a more expensive luxurious uh excuse where you can day drink and i don't want to beat up on brunching i like brunches and sitting outside at a nice cafe etc that, that's great but um yeah this it is this impulse that's there's been a real reckoning i would say in american like the the broadly vaguely left um end of the spectrum between liberals and progressives slash socialists like there's a sharpening of the terms and of the the stakes that has not happened before really and they're they're on the defensive which is good and it's good that like um for all the problems i might have with like some of the kind of superficial woke political culture that's very popular in the united states these days um that also can have in some ways a weird horseshoe effect where this identity fixation and race fixation loops around and ends up parroting right-wing talking points where I, I took out a part of the lecture about Enda Galenda. One of the stupid by debates they've been having is about dreadlocks and white dreadlocks and spending stupid energy and pages talking about why white people shouldn't have dreadlocks is cultural appropriation, which is something that Richard Spencer and Nazis in America did. Yes, white people shouldn't have dreadlocks. They shouldn't listen to hip hop. So this very like reductive ethno-nationalist nonsense. Um, anyway, so my point, it's good that these arguments are coming from women of color um, so that they can't, you know, the, the, the Karens to use another, you know, meme discourse, Karens being, uh, you know, symbolic of a certain kind of like comfortable white middle-class lady who like 
just wants to brunch and have the world her way and doesn't want to upset the apple cart, probably calls the police when they see a black man on the street because, you know, ooh, it's scary. Um, anyway, so it's people like, you know, Rashida Tlaib and AOC that are putting forth a socialist politics. So it's like, oh, now they have to like also deal with not just the kind of superficial identity politics they're comfortable with, but also with a socialist economic um, platform, which is, it, again, it's hard to overstate how new um, this is, I guess, in American political life. And I mean, I, you know, I went to Bernie Sanders rallies, you know, in 2016 and where it was like a stadium full of like 15,000 people just like chanting along to these socialist demands, like something, you know, really unprecedented in American life. And it was happening across the United States. Of course, those hardcore mobilized people can't compare to the millions of, you know, the, the mushy middle or whatever, but it, it's, it's having an outsized effect on the political discourse and it has the brunchers scared. So another form of recuperation that I didn't talk about, but I think is also worth paying attention to. And one of my former professors, Adolf Reed, has been one of the most insightful critics of is the way identity politics is getting used as a stick against more transformative universal politics. We can't really have universal social support and social programs, but what we can have is a more multiracial, more gender inclusive ruling class. So as long as neoliberalism is 13% black, 50% women, 20% queer, and it respects everyone's pronouns, everything's hunky-dory. And this was very, very um, consciously the strategy that was wielded against Bernie Sanders in 2016. And then in 2020, he kind of in some ways took on more of that language that was not there in 2016. He was a class reductionist, which you can make some critiques of, but on the other hand, it also meant that um, he was putting out a politics that wasn't trapped in this like cultural minutia that frankly, most, most Americans, and I would say most people globally kind of hate, it only caters to a very small, extremely online, Twitter oriented um, subculture. And that's not to like throw gender politics or anything else under the bus, absolutely not. But um, if we're going to lead with the critique that, you know, I, I won't throw Katarina under the bus with current debates, but so-and-so is a transphobe because blah, blah, blah. I mean, I saw this also in DSA at a regional leadership meeting a few years back, um, this, you know, trans activist from Oregon came up and said that they wouldn't support Bernie's Medicare for all campaign because it wasn't pro trans enough, which is actually not true it, it, are, it you know there's money for like gender reassignment surgery, but it wasn't prominent enough it wasn't visible enough it's like, is that does that have to be the leading edge of socialist politics, I would say no. Um, and there's a certain kind of moral blackmail that happens it's endemic to identity based movements that has been one of the most corrosive features of building a solid a politics based on solidarity um, in my lifetime, but I think even you know going back to the 60s so that is another legacy that we have to grapple with and is it's quite contentious and anyway that was another damn long winded answer sorry. Okay, I'm impressed that Adolf uh, Reed was your supervisor. He wasn't a supervisor, but he was a, a professor and inspiration. Uh, I, I need to get he could supervise your thesis. He was gone from the new school by uh, the time I uh, okay. started really working there. Uh, yeah, he is, um, I wouldn't agree he is a class reductionist. It's a, yeah. um, a label, like, you know, labels of transphobia and the others that you mentioned that are very easily, you know, thrown around uh, in the left, um, on the scene of the left uh, throughout its very diverse uh, spectrum. But um, he, yeah, he has some very pertinent points, but he has been kind of deplatformed and his discourse has been uh, deplatformed because he has been reduced to Plus, yeah. uh, reductivism. Uh, but that's a side uh, remark. Uh, even, uh, I, I just wanted to underscore that uh, this question of you know identity politics, culturalization of the political, yeah. and class analysis. Uh, this distinction between the two has to become more clear, brought to light, and we shouldn't be afraid of, you know, yeah. be called different names, uh, you know, slurs, uh, 
receive uh, um, insults and slurs and categorizations that might damage our careers. We, we, we should risk, take those risks in order to, uh, you know, prefer a more uh, lucid discussion. On, on, on this question yeah. and uh, but uh, what I wanted to ask you is uh, you, you keep arguing that recuper recuperation is inevitable recuperation is used in the context of your talk uh, if I understood well as a, as cooptation in some way uh, so aren't you worried that the green new deal will be and is being is being co-opted as we speak by uh the elites that want to perpetuate the status quo while ideologically and maybe in some substantial sense also economically uh, repackaging it uh, into a socialist uh model it's uh, ironic that uh, you know the biggest capitalist in the world or ideal of, uh, of capitalism in the world the director of the world economic uh, forum patrick klaus said that we needed a little bit of marx in our analysis now. <laughs> the irony so uh, isn't it mm -hmm. happening as we speak and how do we uh, detect it and how do we uh, keep what's uh, valuable in it uh, but also be vigilant about the risks of cooptation and maybe ruin of what could have been was at the beginning or is perhaps even currently a good thing what, something we aspire to and we want to uh keep it going so yeah how, how do we do this uh monitoring raising alarm and advocate yeah. So, so yes, we do call it uh, uh, the green uh, deal. Green deal, yes. Uh, uh, and also EU. Okay. Uh, yeah. The European Green Deal. Right, European Green Deal. Don't care about the yeah. So During the break, Katerina and I were just discussing briefly, you know, the fact that the Green New Deal in America, of course, the New Deal was like FDR's big you know social as close as we have to like a social democratic system, uh, reform system in america but it was also a very conscious attempt to save capitalism in the wake of the great depression like that's what it was to do and the question is will the green new deal do the same thing or will it point beyond capitalism now people like aoc and bernie sanders are lifelong well at least bernie is a lifelong socialist and aoc i don't know how long she's been a socialist they're, they know that they're socialists. What they want is decommodification that meets you know, human needs, an economy that's directed towards human needs, not profit. And at some point, and this is another thing we were discussing in the break, the kind of idea that we're just gonna like have new green jobs and new green industries that make these investors lots of money is going to come in conflict with you know, the real environmental, um, I don't like the word limits, but constraints on the one hand, and just like, the social logic of like trying to extract profit from every everything commodification of everything so i think um they're very savvy in trying to push for the decommodification of healthcare, of transportation of child care this means to take it out of the realm of capitalist logic even if we're living within capitalism we have to like find the, and i think they're smart in doing this around these things that everyone needs and making them universal rights um so i think that's one way that we can um keep our eye on that particular prize and i think this is calling for a sharpening of our analysis and of course most people they're just like trying to go along hey um you know free or you know highly subsidized child care that sounds good hey having health care for the first time in my life that's not tied to my shitty employer that sounds good hey i mean one thing that always pops up you know europeans are shocked that americans don't have any mandated paid vacation like zero like a lot of people have no vacation um a good a well-paid job might have four weeks and you're doing really well it's like oh man when i live in the czech republic everybody had five weeks germany six eight whatever paid they're just shocked that you know how can you live like that so anyway i think going back to this question of recuperation i think the green new deal presents better problems and a better context for 
having those conversations. When I think back to the left under Bush, when we were responding to Bush, the left at that time was a very crude anti-imperialist, anti-war movement that was just opposing the most blatant kind of neoconservative, you know, smash and grab in, in uh, Iraq. It, would, it did not lead to a sophisticated left that was think it was purely oppositional. And then bef you know, before that, we had the Clinton era, we had the alter globalization movement. We had slightly better problems to deal with. And instead we were dealing with NAFTA, we were dealing with neoliberalism. We successfully problematized neoliberalism and you know, put it into people's minds as like, not just the air we breathe, but as a, a system of life that you know, we could also oppose. So I think, imagine, you know, if we were, so already then we're dealing with neoliberalism under, under uh, Clinton, but if we're operating with a set of political coordinates about eco-socialism or the Green New Deal, that already gets us much further. And of course, there are going to be people that are going to try to co-opt it. That's what I was trying to warn against. But the question is, your question, I mean, it is an open question that we have to think about is how do we avoid that? How can we sharpen? I ended with, what can our demands be that can avoid recuperation? And to me, Matt Huber's piece is very good. The, the two Ds, decarbonize the economy and decommodify the economy. And this is something that social ecology, you know, that sets us apart in some ways from other socialist or eco-socialist tendencies is we ultimately, like I think, you know, small C communists want to abolish the economy as a separate realm that has control over us. We want to simply dissolve it back into the political realm, put it under human control of like, it's not a matter of like its own laws of distribution and blah, blah, blah production. It's about what do we need in life and how do we get it? How do we produce it in a way that's ecological, that's social, et cetera. We wanna get away from it as this, I mean, the subtext of Capital as a critique of political economy, right? Not capitalist political economy, but political economy itself as a discourse of scarcity. Um, so yeah, we want to get rid of the economy. We wanna stop being homo economicus and start being homo social ecologists or something else, I don't know. And your identity politics I um, comment, I totally agree. Adolf Reed can get away with it. He's a black Marxist. <laughs> it's much, much harder for someone like me to articulate. Yeah, and even he's, right. That's right. In DSA, he was invited by one caucus to give a talk, critical of identity politics, and the Afro-Socialist caucus within DSA wrote a response and said, if you, you can't platform him, which is quite sad given he's, you know, an elder statesman of Black socialism and a really important thinker in my view. And it's, it, it was telling that in their response, what this said about the American left, their, their statement said, racism is bad, but race itself isn't. Race can be good. So they actually took a, I mean, very bizarre, right? Like, so there's slippage between understanding race as a social construction that is a fantasy, but that has real effects and then defending it as a social category, which gives people meaning. And there, that we have a lot of work to do in articulating a cosmopolitanism, uh, read. Right. You, tellingly, you don't hear that term like you hear gender abolitionism, right? Because people, frankly, are committed to it, and it's 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 sad, and it's one of those pro one of those um, you know issues that yeah, we have to be courageous and say no, we want a cosmopolitan, anti-identitarian. I mean, it's telling that the far right they call themselves identitarians, and in recent years, there has this has started to be taken up by at least the Western left um, as a critical term, identitarian, as like you're an identitarian and uh, there's it's a contested term but people know what it means it means you reduce things to identity and typically in america to race and you know we've seen a lot with of that in the past year with the black lives matter movement which obviously is like a very important movement against white supremacy and and racialized policing but you have to at some point also ask the strategic question of why some people are very 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 jealously can um protective of a racialized frame to this, despite the fact that, of course, most police violence and police shootings happens against white people, because we still at this point are a white majority. And it's not just white people in general, it's working class white people. So of course, police violence is class. It's about policing the underclass. But some people are very devoted to, you know, not accepting this. And why would you want to like create 
a barrier to entry to like, especially white working class rednecks all across America and the not urban life. They have their own run-ins with police on the regular, let me assure you that. But I'm sure most of them, oh, well, it's hard to say, but I'm sure a lot of them don't have a positive um, uh, opinion towards Black Lives Matter. Well, what if they changed the framing so that it was about like, fuck the cops more generally who are always on our shit and you know controlling our social lives why and i don't want to say like of course all lives matter has been taken up by the right to argue against that and there are of course real disparities black people are far more proportionally represented in the carceral system than white people but as in absolute numbers it's still white people by and large are a huge majority and some of the worst police violence this is actually a piece adolf reed you can google it why racial why race can't make sense of police violence some of the states with um, the highest realm of police shootings are actually the whitest states so how does how does a race reductionist narrative make sense of that it cannot so and there are you know it's a very strong impulse in the american left and one i think we have to really be courageous and be willing to get labeled all kinds of things to call out because it's been highly corrosive to building the kind of solidarities we need to have a multiracial working class socialist movement because the, the majority are you know we are people of color we are trans we are etc cetera, etc cetera, all these things that is within it but if we focus only on those identities we can never build the kind of solidarities and unfortunately in my whatever 30-ish years on the left i have seen movement after movement get tanked by really absurd debates about yeah, just getting fixated on these identity categories. I could give you, unfortunately, example after example of this, but yeah, we have to, we have to challenge that and realize the stakes are much bigger. All right, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Simona has a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I wanna, hi everyone. Hi Blair, hi Zach. Um, I want to second uh, Bianca in thanking the Institute and I mean all of you for, for putting this together. I'm very happy to be here and Blair for, for that really um, extremely interesting uh, presentation. I, I, I was, I'm familiar with, with quite a few of the scholars that you mentioned, but it would be very good uh, if you could maybe like write, write the, the ones that you mentioned in your presentation just for us to for sure. All of us to kind of be, uh, you know, be able to then go, go back to to their work. I'm um, I'm also going to piggyback on Katarina's question in terms of uh, the the green green deal and green new deal. Um, my research revolves around that um, as well. So, so what I'm, I guess it's 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 both a comment and a, and a question. Uh, one of those people, <laughs> but. Um, how do we grapple with the with the uh, you know coloniality uh, and and like the, the the white supremacy that that the the institutionalized proposals of of green new deal put forward right like even the european green new deal for for example it it states in itself that it's the new uh, new growth um, strategy of, for europe right in a in a day and age where we cannot afford to 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 grow more, and then same with the with the resolution in the states, it's um, it's um, it's again um, making bringing the 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 affluence of uh, you know the affected communities within the the states to a level of uh, affluency of the white middle class, for for example, and then how do we how do we tackle this and uh, prevent this from happening? Because who is this, um, right? Who, who will get the, who, we, who will bear the brunt of this happening in the US? Again, it's gonna be communities in the, for, back of, for a lack of a better, uh, you know, word of the global South and, and uh, affected and frontline communities. Not even, we don't even have to go and look uh, as far as the global south, we can look in the Balkans right here, right now, right? Um, where, for example, the, the, the whole, even like the, the green transition, the energy transition, right? It, 
to 100% renewables. Great, we're gonna get to 100% renewables, but how do we get there? Um, so like the work of uh, Zografos and Robbins around um, green sacrifice zones, like who are these, these communities that, that, um, that um, the, mi the mining for, for uh, the new technologies will, will come from, right? And I come from a small town in, in Macedonia where in fact, one of these projects for a copper mine um, was started. So, and we're in the Balkans, right? We're, we're in Macedonia, we're on the periphery of the EU, but, but in a way we're the global south of the, of the EU because those sure. regulations don't even matter. <laughs> don't, don't, uh, they're not, um, you know, valid for, for us. So how, how, how do we deal with, with this? Yeah, I, I know it's a big question. It just, I guess, out there for all of us to think, to think about, but I just, I would be very happy just to hear, to hear your thoughts around it. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, the devil is always in the details. And I mean, your comments would be interesting, I think, to do a comparative analysis of, you know, what some of the conversations about the Green New Deal in America look like versus what they're looking like in Europe. And my sense is that the conversation in Europe is quite different in that it's much more elite led and driven, where in the United States, as I mentioned, it's really percolated from movements through politicians like AOC and Bernie up to, you know, the levels of power. So we were talking a little bit during the break, you know, some of the things being debated right now are like the size of the, you know, Biden's infrastructure bill and really detailed analysis of like what we're going to fund and what we're not going to fund. And I already mentioned the kind of reindustrialization for green jobs versus care work as like low carbon. That's, there's like, you know, democratic um, Congress people who are like saying they're not going to vote for it at all unless it has this. So these things, people are aware of this, um, which is kind of, again, it struck me as a little bit of a surprise that the, 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 the level of nuance and that there's people who are on both sides. You have conservatives and centrists who are saying, I won't sign on if it includes all this other socialist mumbo jumbo. And then you have others who are like, I won't sign it unless it does. So usual, you know, mash of politics. But that was an, another thing specifically we were talking about during the break was the mining component. And this also goes back to Katarina's question about recuperation and the limits of Green New Deal within capitalism. And again, I mean, these Bernie Sanders is a lifetime socialist. He ultimately wants to decommodify large chunks of, of human existence with an eye towards you know, possibly decommodifying everything. I mean, he's a pragmatist, like he has to work within whatever the confines and he's done a good job of popularizing these demands in a way that again, has not him and DSA and the squad, et cetera. So all of a sudden I sound shockingly unlike myself, like this uncritical cheerleader for um, these democratic politicians. But my point is that, you know, there's of course you have the ultra left and deep green critiques of the Green New Deal as new kind of neo-colonial extractivists, et cetera. Um, and I have to say that sometimes they seem too trapped in the logic of capitalism themselves. They assume that for things to transition to a different kind of, you know, green economy, that um, it accepts all the preconditions of capitalism. And of course, we have to be aware of that. That's that is, of course, probably the default setting that many people are pushing towards, and people have been lining up for a long time in a way to like make money off of solar and off of these new energy sources and go down the line of all these, you know, industries that would be affected by a green new deal in whatever form. But, you know, we can push for, let's take the example of mining. We don't, we want to keep those things in the ground, but there's a ton of materials, mined materials, minerals already existing in the world that we could reclaim. It's just not economically efficient under capitalism to do so. But if we're already going to make the money machine go burr and just print more money and throw it at different industries, why not throw it at unemployed young people to go comb through junkyards to reclaim that copper, to reclaim those batteries, to reclaim all those goods? It's not profitable under capitalism, but if we're talking about decommodification and reshifting resources to create a new economy, why not make it so that it's ecologically um, you know, sustainable and not geared towards growth, but towards reusing? And that's not to say that we're going to suddenly just stop all whatever production and extraction. I, I mean, there are certain things we're going to need, and we, those are technical questions going forward. I, I, I don't think we should be held hostage, I guess, by 
a certain um, purism that I see sometimes on the corners of the degrowth movement, which is a movement I have a lot of sympathy for, although again, it's very name to me is problematic because some places do need growth. And I don't think the leading edge of our movements should be um, you know, this kind of green austerity, which is what we've done for a very long time. That's not a that's not a compelling vision, and the people who appeal the degrowth appeals to are typically comfortable Westerners, middle class, who assume a certain level of growth and development and wealth. To tell the global South, oh, degrowth, they're like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. So I think again, it, like population, that can shift, a, change a qualitative problem into a quantitative one. Did I get that right? Yes. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that was a satisfactory answer. I'm not like a scientist or a technician or an engineer. Um, I, I fear a, a total technocratic approach to it. At the same time, I also fear a certain cynical shutdown of any possibility because obviously what's the alternative? Like just an overnight collapse or I don't see a, a glorious eco-communist revolution on the horizon. So again, to me, between reform and revolution is the, the messy world of you know trying to build a different one in the shell of the old and obviously we don't have tons of time and we haven't had tons of time people have been dying from things that aren't climate related for a long time under capitalism so it's a lot of balls to juggle and yeah i don't know um i don't have an easy answer for how we actually do that but again keeping our eyes on the prize and realizing that any green green new deal or any social ecological alternative system is going to have to challenge that basic logic of capitalism. And maybe at some point beyond, once we do that, maybe then we do have to have a conversation about ultimate population. That's to me, this is not the conversation now that is um, the more pressing one. Okay, um, thanks for that. Are there uh, any more questions? Um, okay, can I, I'll just ask a question myself then, um, to sort of uh, further uh, build on all of that. I was wondering, because, um, for instance, of course, much of the West's carbon footprint isn't, uh, it's exported to other countries, um, and so on. So I was wondering if you think there's a danger um, in creating a sort of accidentally isolationist politics that would come from, say, moving away from production in some of these countries, if, if, which have massive environmental impacts. So if, uh, if Brazil isn't producing something like this, for instance, and then we keep it in with more ecological uh, approaches, do we end up, while attempting to sort of universalize something other than capitalism, simultaneously sort of isolate ourselves? Yeah, that's a... It's a good alternative scenario to imagine, kind of like a yeah, green isolationism. One of the things I didn't mention was like these kind of sub-nationalist and, and um, bioregionalist movements that have also been prone to like weird politics and weird recuperation. So one of the main groups that was in the streets of um, the Unite the Right, right rally that killed Heather Heyer in the United States a few years ago, this big, the biggest alt-right gathering was True Cascadia, which is a group who has taken up the the flag of Cascadia, which is where I'm from, like the Pacific Northwest, which, you know, began as this idea of like kind of an eco-socialist ecotopia. And, but it also had, even going back to this book, Ecotopia from the seventies, um, that kind of gave the kind of vision of this bioregionals, whatever, it was kind of what you're saying, like an autarky, very closed off. And so white nationalists took this up and said, well, the Cascadia is already the whitest place in the country. This is a great place for a white ethno state that's also ecological. Um, by, by happenstance, this guy, he died last year. I'm going to forget his name now. But he was a far right guy um, who started this group called the Northwest Front that basically was trying to do this, like an eco local nationalism. He was from my hometown, oddly enough. Um, there was a second part of your question I want to respond to, and now I'm exporting the, oh yeah, exporting the, uh, the, the environmental bads. I mean, I think this also goes back to the quantitative qualitative thing, because if we think of how like capitalism metabolizes natural resources, and this, we could also tie it into maybe David Graeber's idea of bullshit jobs. I mean, just how much extraordinary waste there is under capitalism. 
and again, this goes back to this ecological politics of the working class. We don't have a lot of control over how we work, how we sell our labor. And most people are doing those bullshit jobs. They're fucking producing whatever nonsense that we don't need, et cetera. We certainly don't need on the, on the level and the, um, sorry, in the fade here, the jet lag's kicking in, on the reproducible timeline that we have it in, right? So the circuits of capital need to be radically slowed down. And that would, on its own, slow down so many of these processes. We don't need all this shit coming in from all the way around the world. Of course, it's more efficient and ecologically sound to do it locally. But even if we did, let's say, you know, some things just, we could look into, you know, ecologically powered sail barges. I'd love to be a sailor on an ecologically powered sail barge that brought bananas every now and again from someplace where it can grow to my home where it can't. Like, I don't, I don't think autarky or pure bioregionalism is attractive or the answer. Um, but I think, again, we don't want to get distracted from what is it that forces that kind of metabolism is the fact that for me to support myself, I have to sell these, whatever the fuck it is I'm selling. Um, and we're all trapped and caught up in that. So when you challenge that basic logic of capitalism, all kind and to me, that's really decommodification is what that's about. Then new horizons will open up and new ecological horizons as well. Um, okay, so this is, uh, again, a question about um, the discussions we have, uh, also the scruples to, we have to pose the uh, right questions, uh, you know, the scruples occur when, you know, a certain mantra is established or a certain, like, universally accepted solution, like, you know, decarbonize. Um, you know, that's what we should be focused on. Uh, so I want to challenge this, uh, like, I don't know, universal consent that that's the, 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 the problem and that's the, and there is the solution and that's the only solution. Uh, because if this is correct, and I'm, uh, I will pose, uh, pose this question in my uh, uh, based on my amateurish, you know, uh, research uh, um, on the matter, if it's correct, and this is published in the physics world, a scientific journal, if it's correct that 50% of the heat comes from the core of the earth, if this 50% is produced by radioactive decay, if it's correct that uh, the at the beginning, I, I wasn't sure if the radioactive decay was natural or human uh, caused by human activity. Uh, then I did some more research. It turns out that most of it is caused by mining. So um, aren't we supposed to ask this question as well on uh, whether you know decarbonize everything is the solution to everything? Uh, it's a bit ironic that we have to do all this research and you know we have to master certain sciences or areas of sciences in order to ask the right the right questions but it seems that i'm not saying that this is the right question but it is a relevant question maybe somebody with the much more knowledge mm. will you know refute the relevance of this question immediately but i uh, but I want to be able to ask it. And if I ask it, uh, it's immediately perceived as, you know, something um, covertly anti-ecological um, or whatever, or anti the Green Deal, uh, or, you know, uh, it's just the climate is uh, so difficult for uh, having a proper co conversation on these issues. That's the main thing, uh, if we could, get over this polarized climate of public debate, mm -hmm. we might have a normal conversation. I mean, um, I would be happy to hear if somebody could, you know, explain to me if this is the case, mm -hmm. if the core of the problem is uh, perhaps more mining and has been for a long time, also storage of uh, nuclear uh, waste. It's all stored deep in the earth and it must decay, right? So radiation is caused uh, 
uh, by that as well. So, you know, physics uh, world says mm -hmm. that 50% of the global warm, war, warming comes from within and from radioactive uh, decay. So what if uh, our entire focus is just on one issue, decarbonization, decarbonization, and we miss on this problem? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, everything I'm saying right now is factually correct. Uh, it's just something that I've been preoccupied uh, with and by recently, and I want to hear your opinion, maybe not technical and scientific, but uh, maybe on the matter of how we lead this conversation. Good question. And I see some points of connection with, um, with Petar's question before about the primacy of climate and also like, yeah, looking at other issues like biodiversity loss. And yeah, no, I think it's, both are points well taken that, you know, we've seized in some ways opportunistically on climate change as this seeming existential threat. And um, we, that shouldn't blind us to the other things that are maybe not directly related to climate or have different causes or different issues, whether that's, you know, deforestation, mining, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, another one that pops up to mind is like, um, I mean, related in a way to climate and to mining, but is like the energy debates. So right now, you know, there's been a lot of taking out of relatively green hydroelectric dams in the Pacific Northwest, um, both for mostly for salmon reasons, like to, to preserve salmon fisheries, which also are very connected to Native American, you know, culture, but also industry. And so there's a very complicated interaction between ecological claims, indigenous claims, specific industries like fisheries, which also are like symbolic for native people, but also for the region as a whole as like salmon or whatever, um, because that is a relatively cheap and, you know, relatively green um, energy source. And then we could go down the line. I mean, I think, again, I am not an engineer and these, this is not exactly my wheelhouse, but from what I understand, you know, people are talking about more localized energy sources that are tailored to um, the ecology it's within. So more tidal energy, you know, for coastal places, combinations of wind, which of course there's problems with, but, you know, um, geothermal, et cetera. And specifically about the mining and the heat, I, I know nothing about that. It's new information to me. I'll, I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask uh, Brian Tokar, my colleague, he's, he's the M MIT physicist guy. So he can, um, he could probably give some insight, but I think that's actually a great opportunity though, too, to also like going back to this composition of like left movements and discourses like in the sixties, a lot of, especially in the United States, um, a lot of the early generation of new left people were people that came from a hard science background. I mean, we talked a little bit about Chomsky, but I mean, there's others and a lot of the, the kind of leadership of groups like SDS had that. And that's of course, totally changed like humanities and social sciences in the last 40 years. But I think the, you know, because of, climate ecological issues and the engineering questions it poses, it's a great opportunity to like, you know, bring that back into the fold and learn from things that we haven't learned about. And again, it's not been my wheelhouse, but um, I think it's an exciting arena. I mean, another, you know, pretty sharp debate that's happening is an increasing amount of socialists who are entertaining um, nuclear as a, as a potentially green energy source. And that's a very contentious debate. I mean, I don't have, yeah. Um, Maybe I can fight PCC, which is the uh, International Panel of uh, Climate Change, which is uh, a body of uh, environmentalists, a lot of environmentalists of a lot of, of all countries. And it is uh, uh, mainly quite conservative. They have uh, anonymously uh, uh, and finally said that uh, in the latest report from this year that human activities uh, is producing uh, the greenhouse gases. Uh, so it is not only carbon, but uh, greenhouse gases in total. That first, uh, and so it is not something like uh, we are starting to debate something, but it is a conclusion definite uh, of, uh, of this panel. And second point, I agree that uh, 
there is some reduction uh, concerning uh, climate crisis. It is, it is not only climate crisis. For example, John Bell and Rick Foster is uh, talking about ecological uh, crisis, we, uh, of which one part is uh, climate crisis, the other important part is uh, the sixth uh, massive uh, extinction, and so on. For, uh, for example, you have uh, uh, impoverishment of uh, the ground, which is very important, which in itself is a, is a problem and not connected to directly uh, uh, totally to the cri climate crisis. There is no uh, climate warming and that it's not uh, created by human activity. On the contrary, I am saying that there is such thing, but it's not just the gases, it's also a radioactive decay uh, due to mining coming from the core of the earth. So it contributes by 50% to global warming, and according to what I just quoted, I, I have several articles here. So my point is still a uh, climate crisis and global warming. It's just that it's not uh, produced only on the surface and it's not only in the form of gases, but also comes from within, but it's, uh, uh, it's an ecological crisis and it's climate crisis, except the, the uh, places of origin are also from underneath not just on the surface this was my only point i'm not saying that it's a natural process yeah, coming yeah, from yeah like, ah, okay. right. uh, well that seems like a good uh, natural place to stop uh we'll now have a, a two-hour lunch break uh so everyone will come back at, at three uh for stravko's lecture um, and don't forget again that you need to click on the new Zoom link uh, to be sent to everyone. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, everyone enjoyed themselves and uh, be seeing you soon. Thanks everyone for tuning in for the great questions. I enjoyed the uh, conversation quite a bit. Looking forward to continuing it. Thank you. Thank you.